good day, folks. Uh, welcome back to the Word Live. Uh, today uh, is, first of all, the first day of spring for us here in good old southern New Brunswick. Uh, and it's going to be more talking trees again. And our main tree of the day is the balsam fir. But first, uh, we're not going to talk about the specifics of balsam fir, but rather how I treat or deal with balsam fir. So, and I didn't invent this. Uh, certainly, Jamie Simpson mentions it in his book. Right in this area here, this is a patch cut. Uh, I would say the diameter is roughly 40 to 50 feet, which is a approximately the height of the surrounding tree. So when I come in here, basically what I'm looking for is fur and psh, they're gone. <laughs> Ooh, they're, nasty. They, they are down. <laughs> if you're not a fur, then you definitely stay. That's um, a maple. So this red maple, now uh, these, if you look at the, notice his bark, he's probably quite an elderly tree because uh, they don't normally get this rough bark until they're a fairly decent age. So he's had a rough life in here. Uh, and now with some sunlight around on the ground, he has a better chance of getting some seeds down and, and getting some regeneration in here that will hopefully outgrow the fir. Red maple is a fairly fast growing tree and very good for climate change. So we cut out the fir that is absolutely the least preferred tree probably of all for climate change uh, and try and get something else. Just about anything else. Right. <laughs> so in here Anything that's dead is still standing. Anything that's uh, not fur is still standing. So, which isn't a lot of stuff. This is actually a live fur that I haven't taken. He's around the perimeter, close to the perimeter of this. So, again, the intent is not to totally wipe out fur but certainly take out enough of them to get some light on the ground. And uh, hopefully, if we have some seed sources, that we get some something different. Oh, the birch is, that birch is dead, but there's also, around the, around the perimeter, there's a live birch there's or two. There's a little bit are, of birch, yeah. They will stay. So this is there are a couple of uh, small red spruce, yep. not very big ones, but they're left behind. But just notice the difference because we have two. Just, okay, we, ha we have a, a red spruce here and another one. Another just a little bit there, right? a smaller one, yep. Look what we have right in here. <laughs> a mess. We have like probably 50 fur in, in a three foot circumference. A future fur thicket. This is suicidal. In this kind of competition, that's ultimately there's only room in that space for one tree at best. And there's 50 of those little fur. All in, which is why you get these fur thickets, is that they just grow, and they grow, but then they can't grow anymore. And they, they just, just sit there. dying <laughs> off and, you know, anyhow, uh, they're a nasty little tree. Except at Christmas time. Except at Christmas time. <laughs> yes, thank you. They, they're the best Christmas trees around. The other, the other <laughs> benefit of doing a patch cut of this size and nature is that these trees have generally been fairly closely growing and so to just open up a much wider area you risk 
certainly low down. Like even in this small uh, patch, uh, I did have two or three trees per, fortunately, <laughs> uh, that did blow down. And I've cleaned those up some, but uh, you have to be very careful to, to kind of open these areas up as gently as you can and uh, not get too wild crazy about it or uh, unless you have absolutely rock solid wind firm trees that to my mind would be deciduous and white pine. And white pine. They're the best that I know of and uh, but if you have fir, uh, the, the spruces, white, red, black, you know. Uh, how about cedar? How do they do? Now uh, cedar, well, we certainly got a fair number of blowdowns, but what we're getting with cedar a lot more is they have these forks in, the, in them. <laughs> and uh, often six feet in the air, eight, ten, twelve, uh, and I have no idea what causes the forks in these uh, cedars, because certainly some of them are well up above the browse level of, like there's no deer that's browsing cedar at an eight foot level, right? But you'll see lots of cedar around here with, with forks starting to glow up in those areas. And those, those uh, limbs are just blowing out of the trees. <laughs> uh, walked into one, one spot uh, and uh, half of the cedar trees in there, there are probably four or five in just a 40 foot area that all had the tops blown out of them. All right, so let's talk about the, the biology, the, the basics of the balsam fir tree. <laughs> Which we already know is not your favorite tree. <laughs> So, this, so is, this, this is one less balsam fir. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is another way, and believe me, I have picked a lot of balsam fir, oh, and, and, and Demi too, this way. Uh, so the needles are flat. The only other uh, conifer that has flat needles, well, you could include cedar, It's because it is flat. It's pretty distinctive. But yeah. it's pretty distinctive is this and the hemlock and we'll also probably talk about the hemlock uh, so if it's got a flat needle and there's no distinct white stripe on the bottom there is a faint one there that the camera probably won't even pick up probably not it's it's a fur uh, characteristics of the balsam fir one thing it's very messy if you are actually processing it and get close enough to like turn it into firewood and actually pick it up and carry it in your arm and so on. Uh, they this, leak. <laughs> this, this jacket has come in close counter with lots and lots of fur and uh, fur has sap pockets which are just full of little gooey sap <laughs> And I tried popping a few. This looks like one right here. Can you get right in close? Okay, see what happens. See oh, yeah, it? yeah, can see them bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> so they have just literally many of those. So if all you do is come along with your chainsaw, cut them down, and walk away, uh, you probably not too bad but if you actually get in there picking it up cutting bucking it splitting it you know and handling it with your hands and everything it's it's pretty messy <laughs> this is where you need goo gone <laughs> well in spruce I mean they have their their spruce gum you know sap yes. that can but to my mind there's nothing like the fur for you know so for characteristics uh, the balsam fur is is highly shade tolerant so it's it's shade tolerant and so that means it competes with all the other shade tolerant trees importantly for it if the conditions are right it can uh, root down much much quicker and easier than red spruce or or any of the other competing conifers 
So if you open up an area with with a mixture of conifers, uh, without doubt, well, we just saw it. <laughs> like we saw two red spruce, and they were probably one was like uh, three or four years older than the other. So we'll say in a half a dozen years, there's two spruce. Uh, red spruce regeneration in that area and, and there dozens in less space there's, there's there's 50 fur right <laughs> so they're aggressive little fellers and so that's why our woodlots by and large in New Brunswick are just full of this tree and way more than what it would have been in the original Acadian Wabanaki forest now you said it was shade tolerant, but it just kind of stalls out, does it not? Right. Like, like ultimately, as as you grow, you always need more sunlight, right? Like that little seedling. <laughs> there goes another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another one. Another one bites the dust. Like that's all he has, he just has to get enough sunlight to support this little bit of growth, right? But when you're talking an eight foot or 10 foot tree with, with branches, right? Like you need more sunlight you need to more support food. <laughs> that larger body. Right. And because they're crowding and competing with each other, uh, I mean, they will stay, a fir thicket will stay alive for who knows? I mean, <laughs> this stuff in here is probably at least 30 years old. And there is death amongst some of these trees. Like there's one, two, three, four, four or five dead trees all within 10 feet of this me. little space. But, uh, you know, there are still an equal number of trees that, that I cut that were alive. So they, they do compete, but most of them are not successful. And that's, I mean, that's the story of the whole forest, right? Uh, you take an acre of, of bare naked ground and it can have a couple of thousand seedlings in it. Uh, a mature growth of that would have probably less than 100 trees. So out of 2,000, you get down to maybe 100. So there's a lot of deaths along the way as... as to as, make a forest. <laughs> as the forest matures, right? Uh, you know, it's just a constant process. Within the healthiest of all forests, you will see there's just constantly trees dying in the process. And, and that's, fertilizing the soil and... Right, the, the story of life. Uh, larger big trees become habitat for squirrels and raccoons and all kinds of critters and so on. And uh, yeah, dead, dead trees are, are vital to a healthy woodlot. And, but balsam fir just... Is less vital. <laughs> yeah. And, and really, if if you don't if you don't manage it at a fairly young age, uh, you can go through and thin out those fir trees uh, once they're say 25, 30 years old, and chances are they will not ever resume growing at a regular, normal rate. They will be they will be suppressed, and they will have no no ability to really grow into anything that's worthwhile. So they're just stalled out. They're just stalled out. Uh, what else do we know about balsam fir? It's fairly shallow rooted in most cases, so a very subject to, to blow down. Uh, a lot of the balsam fir in southern New Brunswick has, has butt rot. Uh, that sounds gross. I know. <laughs> Probably of all the the, uh, the balsam fir that you see bent over like this, uh, half of them 
have been uprooted and the other half has simply been broken off. Uh, we should probably have some examples. So, so here's uh, a group of our friends. Now there is some uh, red spruce in here too. So they will be the ones that will ultimately dominate. Uh, the other downfall or negative side of fur, in fact I was just reading, reading a New Brunswick brochure recently, uh, they rated the fur, balsam fur, as living uh, between, I believe, 70 and 130 years. That's relatively short. For a tree, yeah. The, the red spruce is certainly uh, 300 years, and I think up a bit from that. Uh, the soon to be talked about, uh, well, maybe in another video, uh, hemlock, it can be over 400 years old. So it's not long lived by tree standards, which is why in a truly mature Acadia forest, fir was never dominant. Because it tie out faster. Right. So even though they're more competitive than the red spruce, ultimately the red spruce just and the hemlock just outlived them. And so therefore, <laughs> the, 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 the mature Acadian forest had a lot more red spruce and hemlock than it did fir. Fir would crop up largely when you had a significant wind event that maybe blew down several acres or more of trees, then, then the fir would regain some, some possession of that property, piece of property until eventually again succession takes them over and bam. So that's the story of fir. Uh, great Christmas tree. Uh, otherwise, it's not doing your woodlot a whole lot of benefit. <laughs> Well, and the space you're in right there, so this would be an area that to come out with kind of the whoppers and take out the fur in between the spruce. Well, again, uh, or will re this remember my uh, easy, easy uh, managing your regeneration? Really, all you have to do is just right break them off. All I want to do is give that red spruce a chance to outcompete this guy. And if I just come along every now and then and just make sure that... <laughs> that the spruce guys are the tallest. <laughs> and that he's getting... Because by and large, this side competition is, is good for the red spruce. It forces them to concentrate growing upward rather than spreading out, uh, which makes a better, ultimately, tree, commercial tree. So, heavy so if, if I was surrounded by balsam fir, I'd grow upward instead of sideways? You might. How about we put you out here in the patch and <laughs> Plant see? Plant me out here and see what happens. Uh, I'll come back for you <laughs> before winter. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the competition is good. What you just want to do is make sure that your preferred tree wins. And I have never seen a video on or anything on just doing this kind of simple stuff. What they would have you do is go out, spend twelve hundred plus dollars to get yourself a thinning saw. You come in here and until you achieve professional status with that tool, you've cut out the fur, but you've also probably you've damaged, damaged, damaged heavier, heavier yeah. red spruce. What you're trying to save. Right? And now you've got trees that have no surrounding competition, so now they're sitting there growing fat and lazy <laughs> like the rest of us. <laughs> And so they're not going they, to They have up. life too easy. <laughs> and so they're not, I mean, if, it, if it's overdone, they, they are not going to be the best commercial tree specimen that you could get. Now for us, commercial quality is largely irrelevant at right. this stage in our management. But ultimately, you, 
we don't want to bypass nature entirely. Nature knows what it's doing, and competition for these critters is good. We're just right? giving a little helping hand. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and again, only because we're at a stage where Mother Nature will deal with this problem, but it's going to be six of my lifetimes to get there. Well, and really it's people intervening that have created this problem in the first place, so. Yes. <laughs> so it would be nice to intervene and speed. We're speeding the process along, right? Like the fur, if totally left alone in this woodlot, you know, uh, 500 years from now, her, well, in fact, climate change. It's going to take it out anyway. By but. the end of this century, there are <laughs> people who predict that fur will not exist in the province of New Brunswick. I think that's more hopeful than, because it's persistent, right? It yes. may not do well, but that doesn't but it, mean it's, it's just going still to be give up here. the ghost and, yeah. and totally disappear, you know. Uh, anyhow. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. <laughs> Catch you on the next one. See you next time, guys.